Amen. Amen. Thank you, Doris, for that wonderful song. Uh, good morning, church. What a wonderful day it is. What a wonderful blessing it is to be in the house of the Lord with you all this morning. My name is Pastor Lonnie. I'm the pastor of Family Ministries here at Middle River. I'm here to welcome you all this morning. So if you are new to Middle River, uh, if this is your first time or if you've been here a couple of times, we want to welcome you. Thank you for joining us this morning. I want you to look at the edge of your pews. You're going to see what we have. They're called our connection cards. Uh, we put these cards out in the last couple of weeks. These cards are designed for you to connect to the church so we can learn more about you. Uh, and you can learn more about us. So you'll see a section on there where you can fill out your information. You can sign up for our weekly or monthly newsletter. But there's also a section on the bottom uh, where if you make a commitment uh, this week, this morning in service, or if you need prayer requests, we want you to fill that out. And all that we ask is that you place it in the offering plate as it goes around this morning. And that way uh, we can connect with you, we can pray for you, and we can make sure that your needs are met here at Middle River. All right, so let's pray and we'll get started this morning. Uh, dear Lord, we thank you, Father, for your many blessings. Uh, Lord, we thank you for another day, another morning, another opportunity to come into your house and to worship you, Father. And Lord, as we uh, sit before you, Lord, as we sing and as we listen to the word, Father, we pray that you would align our hearts to your will and your purposes, Lord. We pray that we would hear from you, Lord, and that you would guide us and direct us in the days to come, Father. So we ask these things and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good morning, Middle River. Uh, let's prepare our hearts for worship this morning. We're going to stand and sing three verses of Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. Please stand.
We have a couple of quotes this morning on commitment, and Lonnie's going to start us off with one. Good morning, church. Um, so this morning, Pastor Keith is preaching on commitment and how important it is for us to be committed as members of the body of Christ. And when I think about commitment, I think about how uh, God first loved us, and our commitment starts with him as he loves us, and then we love him as a result of his love. But I'm going to read a quote for you all this morning, uh, and, it, and it's from Ben Tavner. Uh, and this is what it says. It says, a spouse who is 85% faithful uh, to their, their mate is not faithful at all. Uh, there is no such thing as part-time loyalty of Jesus Christ. And this quote from John MacArthur says, the Christian life is not adding Jesus to one's own way of life, but renouncing that personal way of life for his and being willing to pay whatever cost that may require. Church's health, 
and then a profile of the Middle River community. We'll soon be conducting a membership survey to glean feedback from the congregation. So if we get your input, details uh, will be forthcoming, and we ask you to participate with that survey and that survey in the days ahead. As your pastor search committee, we cover it in constant prayers as we seek God's will and find in the next senior pastor for Middle River Baptist Church. You see on the screen the names of your uh, senior pastor search committee. Please uh, keep us in prayer. If you can write down those names and uh, pray for us daily as, or as often as you think of us. Uh, please, please, please pray, pray, pray for your senior pastor committee. Today also begins the week of prayer for the Baptist Associations of the Southern Baptist Convention. Our very own Baptist, uh, Baltimore Baptist Association staff, our Pastor Tally Wilkins, Executive Direct Director, and our very own Ms. Teresa Sassard, Executive Office Administrator. I'd like to call the ushers forward now for the offering as we offer a offertory prayer and prayer for these two requests. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time of worship that we can lift you on high, that we can praise you, to serve you and learn more about you and to hear from your word and our, through our pastor as he speaks the word of God and preaches your message to us today. We ask your blessings on him. We ask your blessings on the, the message that your word will accomplish all that you have sent it forth to do. We pray for our pastor search committee that you would lead us and guide us and continue to Move us toward the uh, person that you have called for Middle River Baptist Church as a, our new senior pastor. So you will lead us into the future, into this new time and, and very complex times uh, that we are facing in our world today. But we pray for him, we pray for your leadership, that we will go from here and forward to accomplish great things for you and attempt great things for you. We pray that uh, you would also be with our Baltimore Baptist Association along with other Baptist Associations of the Southern Baptist Convention. We pray especially for Pastor Callie Wilkins, our Executive Director, and Ms. Teresa Sassar, that you, our Executive Office Administrator. We ask that you would so bless them in their daily walk and their daily uh, work that they do for us and especially as they, what they do for pastors and churches. They are such a blessing to so many throughout our um, here in the Baltimore Baptist area but also throughout the, the Southern Baptist Convention. We ask your blessings on them and we ask your blessings on the staff and offer that they may be used to glorify you for, in your work in your kingdom throughout the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. In the ancient church, the Kyrie was sung quite often. And it was because they knew that in their commitment to Christ, they still fell terribly short of what they could be and should be. And I'm going to sing about that for you this morning.
when you think about the cooperative program, I see myself and our church locking arms with 46,000 other churches with one thing in mind, and that is what Jesus told us to do. I think we're way better together than we are as individuals. And so, man, I may be speaking to somebody who is thinking about planting a church. Man, why would you want to plant a church by yourself? You're setting yourself up for failure. No, you want to surround yourself with the greatest people you can. And if that's other churches, praise God for that, because you're going to need the support. You need family. But when you think about the cooperative program, it's the reason I'm a Southern Baptist. I just personally believe that the cooperative program is the greatest way for us to effectively live out the Great Commission. And so we get the opportunity to be a part of that. We get to give towards something so much bigger than ourselves. You get the chance to give to something that is huge. Amen. We are blessed to be a part of the cooperative program uh, that our money is going to so many different areas and touch so many needs, whether it be missions abroad uh, or, or at home here. Uh, so many ways uh, our money uh, can uh, do ministry through this cooperative program. Uh, this morning, our scripture reading is going to be from Joshua chapter 24, verses 1 through 15. I'm going to ask you all to stand for the reading of the Word of God. Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel. And they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terah, the father of Abraham, of Nahor, and they served other gods. Then I, looked, then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau, and I gave Esau the hill country of Seir to possess. But Jacob and his children went down to Egypt, and I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt with what I did in the midst of, the, of it. And afterwards I brought you out. Then I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you came to the sea. And the Egyptians pursued your fathers with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. And when they cried to the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians, and made the sea come upon them and covered them. And your eyes saw what I did in Egypt. And you lived in the, in the wilderness a long time. Then I brought you to the land of the Amorites, who lived on the other side of the Jordan. They fought with you, and I gave them into your hand, and you took possession of their land, and I destroyed them before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and fought against Israel, and he sent and invited Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not listen to Balaam. Indeed, he blessed you, so I delivered you out of his hand. And you went over to the Jordan and came to Jericho, and the leaders of Jericho fought against you, and also the Amorites and the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Gergeshites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And I gave them into your hand, and I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out before you, the two kings of the Amorites. It was not by your sword or by your bow. I gave you a land on which you had not labored, and cities that you had not built, and you dwell in them. You eat the fruit of the vineyard and olive orchards, that you did not plan. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods of your fathers, the, the gods that your fathers served before beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. You may be seated. Today, as we've been journeying with Joshua, we come to the end of our journey, at least for now. And we see that in chapter 23, mm -hmm. Joshua gave a charge to the leadership before he died. And then in chapter 24, which Lonnie read part of just now, he gathers all the people together for another one of these covenant renewal services. And he charges 
and calls the people of Israel to commitment to the covenant God had made with them. In chapter 23, he had warned them about falling away, what we call apostasy, leaving the faith. He told them to cling to the Lord, to love the Lord, and that that would keep them from falling away. And now in his farewell address, Joshua called Israel to the commitment, to the covenant. He knew this, without commitment, they were doomed. And so what does our journey in Joshua teach us about commitment? And I want us to look at some insights about true commitment to God. Now, first of all, commitment is motivated by remembering all that the Lord has done for you. Has the Lord done anything for you? Amen. Commitment is motivated by constantly remembering the commitment God has and all that he has done to us, for us. By rehearsing this, Joshua begins by rehearsing for them all that God had done for them. It's interesting in these first 13 verses. In rapid succession, 17 times I think if you count them. In rapid fire repetition. Thus says the Lord, I did this for you, I did that for you, I did that. 17 times God says, I did it. You didn't do it. I did it. God says, I chose you. Look in chapter 24, in the beginning of chapter 24, along about verse 3, he says, Then I took your father Abraham. I called, I went and called Abraham. He was in a family that served other gods. And you see, God called Abraham and started the nation Israel. God says, your very identity is because I called you to begin with. If it hadn't have been that I initiated it, you wouldn't be the people of God. If it hadn't have been for God's grace and moving toward us, we would not be the people of God at all. God says, I chose you. I called you. God takes the first step, you see, in your salvation. If you've got some yearnings in your heart today to move to God, it's because God's moving toward you first. God chose you. Jesus said to his disciples, I chose you, you didn't choose me. And so God's grace comes to you. And then God says, I delivered you. Look in verse 5. He says to Israel, and I sent Moses. You know that guy, Charlton Heston, some of you remember him as. He says, I, I sent Moses down there, and he was the great deliverer who helped you to exit out of Egypt. I delivered you from those plagues. I sent those plagues as judgments. I did it all. I sent those judgments on Egypt, on Pharaoh. He says, I delivered you. He says, I guided you. Look in verse 8. He reminds them, I brought you. You didn't bring yourself. I brought you to the land of the Amorites who lived on the other side of the Jordan. They fought with you and I gave them into your, notice, I gave them into your hand. You didn't do this by yourself. And you took possession of their land because I promised it to you and I gave it to you. God says, I guided you. He says, I chose you, I delivered you, I guided you. You notice God's doing all this. He brought them into the promised land. It's what we've been studying in the book of Joshua. And he says, I, I gave you the power to do all this. I empowered you. Look in verse 11. And you went over the Jordan and came to Jericho. You remember that walled-in city, that great fortress. And the leaders of Jericho fought against you. All these Amorites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hittites, Gergeshites, and Termites. Just trying to see if you listen. He says, I gave you the power to defeat them. I empowered you. Now has God chosen you in Christ? Yes. Has God delivered you through salvation through Christ? Has God guided you during your lifetime by His grace? Has God empowered you to do things in his service yes you see god is reminding them 
Remember all that I have done for you. And this will, this will, you see, keep you committed to me. This will keep you faithful. It's when you take for granted those blessings, you see. And we have to agree, when Israel would get in trouble when they took God's blessings for granted. They would forget God and then they would go off into apostasy and worship other gods. The same thing happens to us. So, let me give you two words. Grace. Grace, God's, God's favor and his blessing and all that he has done for us in Christ and all that he continues to do and all that he will do in eternity. Grace means God's unmerited love. We don't deserve it. We can't earn it. But God's given it to us in Christ. He loved us though we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Grace. We're saved by grace. We live by grace. We'll go to heaven by grace. If you get to heaven, there won't be one loudmouth Baptist there bragging about how he or she got there on their own merits. They'll look and say, I'm amazed I'm even here. If but by the grace of God, I wouldn't be here. Grace, grace, grace. But grace always leads to gratitude. And a deep sense of gratitude is what will motivate you to be committed. That is why we are committed. We are not committed to God in order to be saved. We are committed to God because we have already been saved by grace. And grace is what motivates us. You know what? I heard a story one time about a guy that was motivated. And he was being chased by a bear. And this bear was hot on his tail. And he ran as hard as he could. He thought, oh my Lord, he said that bear is going to eat me alive. I better run as fast as I can. He took off running. And the bear kept getting closer and closer to him. He saw a tree limb about 15 feet off the ground. He said, my only prayer is to jump for that. Run and jump as hard as I can and catch that tree limb. Maybe I won't get eat up by this, eaten up by this bear. He took off running. The bear is hot on his trail. And he ran as hard as he could. And he leaped and jumped to catch that tree limb and he missed it. But he caught it on his way down. <laughs> now what that means is he was so motivated he jumped higher than he ever thought he could jump. What motivates you to do things for God? I doubt nothing if, if the cross of our Lord Jesus, the grace of the Lord Jesus that God showed us at the cross, if that doesn't motivate us to commitment, I doubt anything ever will. At all. I could get up here and guilt you into commitment. I could get up here and scare you into commitment. But it is the love of God in the cross, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that motivates us to commitment. Yesterday I did a funeral for a dear friend who died of ALS. It was a a draining day. I was really close to him. And after six years of his struggle with ALS, he, he, he went home to be with the Lord. In fact, I went over to see him in March. He lives in, lived in Delaware, and I went over there. And, uh, we went out and ate oysters. Uh, he loved oysters, and he, he took me out. His wife had to actually feed him because he couldn't use his arms. And we had such an enjoyable time. His name was Jim. I will never forget Jim. And that, that time we went over there, we went back to the house and he sat me down and he, he wanted to tell me everything that he wanted done at his funeral. I've not had many people sit down with me themselves and say, I know I'm gonna die. Here's what I want you to do. Here's what I want you to read. But everything he wanted me to read and everything he wanted me to say was recalling the grace of God Amen. in his life through what Jesus had done, through scriptures, through the message. Well, years ago when I started pastoring in Liberty Baptist Church, I didn't know Jim very well and he, was a de he became a deacon eventually, but he was kind of a nominal Christian the only time I saw him was at the back door. We shake hands. I'll see you next Sunday. Really didn't know each other that well. But then he got in a small group. 
And one night we were studying the Bible and I was visiting this, this one of our what we call growth groups. Jim was sitting to my right and they began to pray in the group and Jim began to pray and he began to weep. And I wasn't too spiritually attuned at the time as a pastor and I thought to myself, what's up with Jim? I'm thinking this while our heads are bowed up. There must be something wrong with Jim. He must have a problem. Maybe he needs some counseling. Wasn't of anything wrong with Jim whatsoever. Everything was right. He had been reading through the Bible and he had begun to grasp what grace meant. And he began to grasp the great teachings and doctrines of grace in the Bible through Jesus Christ. It so overwhelmed him that it was like he was a mechanic at the uh, U.S. Air, worked on airplanes, great mechanic, worked on airplane engines. But it was like God put a new jet engine in him. And he was motivated now to love God, love people, be generous, serve. It was like he had a spiritual awakening and that gratitude he had for the grace of the Lord Jesus that was awakened in him, motivated him to live for Christ and be committed to Christ. That's what we're talking about here. We're talking about commitment is motivated. It's motivation. But it's always by remembering all that God has done for you in Christ. God says, I've provided for you. Has God provided for you? He says in verse 13, the land you enjoy, the cities you're in, the vineyards, the olive groves. You didn't get this stuff. I gave it to you. God had done it all. Everything they had. Israel. God had given it to them. Now think about all the Lord has done for you and his grace. Bring to mind those memories. This is a um, gratitude as a defense. It's a strong defense against a heart that tends to pro be prone to wander from God and leave its first love. So always keep going back. You say, you know, Joshua is preaching his last sermon here. You say, Pastor, if you knew you're going to die tomorrow, what sermon would you preach? I know exactly what I would preach. I'd preach from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 and 4. Paul said, I deliver to you as a first importance. You see, because I think that Paul's saying this is the most important message you'll ever hear in your life. The gospel. He says, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. That's what I preach on. You know why? He said, why would you preach on that? I would preach that because it's the gospel and it, I owe everything I have and everything I am because of that message, the gospel. And that's what keeps you committed, remembering, remembering the gospel grace and all that God has done for you. To God be the glory. See, that's the way to live. To God be the glory. To God be the glory for the things he has done. With his blood he has saved me. With his power he has raised me. To God be the glory for the things he has done. Not us. He has done for us. Just let me live my life. Let it be pleasing Lord to thee. And if I gain any praise, let it go to Calvary. It's a great song, isn't it, Bruce? I told you about that. You probably sung it, wouldn't you? <laughs> Commitment is motivated by remembering all that the Lord has done for you. What else is commitment according to Joshua? And number two, the second insight about this kind of commitment is that that God calls us to, that Joshua called Israel to, is that commitment requires choosing who you will serve. Make a choice. Get off the fence. Stop being indecisive. Joshua called the Israelites to choose whom they would serve. Verse 15, it's a key section here. Choose this day, Joshua says, after rehearsing all of what God had done for Israel, running them through their history up to that point, Joshua now says, make up your mind. 
Choose this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river, you know, back there in Egypt, they worshipped all those false gods, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're now dwelling. You make up your mind who you're going to serve. You're going to serve those gods which really are no gods at all, those gods with the little g, or are you going to serve Yahweh the God? He says, choose. Choose who you're going to serve. Paul says the same thing in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. He says, so then, brothers, in view of God's mercies, after, if you study the book of Romans in the first 11 chapters, Paul rehearses everything God has done for us in the gospel. He gets to the end of chapter 11, he says, oh, the, the greatness of God. And then in chapter 12, he says, so then, in view of God's mercies, present yourselves. You see, in light of what God's done, present yourselves as a sacrifice, not a dead sacrifice, but a living sacrifice, not a lifeless sacrifice, a living sacrifice, a holy sacrifice, for he says in that text, it's just your reasonable, logical service in light of what God's done. So make a choice. Choose to make a commitment. Each person must choose for himself. Make up your mind. I once, Bruce, I didn't know he was going to do this, uh, selected that quote in the service today by Vance Hapner. And I, I had uh, heard a story. Actually, I heard Vance Hapner preach, I think a couple of times, and he was up in his years. And the last time I remember, I was at Colesville Baptist Church up in the balcony listening to this famous Baptist preacher, Vance Havner, preach. And Vance Havner told a story one time that he, when he was young, met the renowned preacher, R.A. Torrey, on a train. Think of that, Dr. Havner and R.A. Torrey. Uh, Havner was very young. He hadn't decided what to do with his life. R.A. Torrey asked Vance Havner, what plans do you have for your life? Havner hemmed and hauled around the ballot and really couldn't say directly. And Dr. Torrey looked him straight in the eye and he said, young man, make up your mind what you're going to do. And Havner said, those words of challenge made a lasting impact on his life. Make up your mind what you're going to do. Are you going to be committed to Christ? Are you going to choose to serve Him or other gods, other loyalties? Make up your mind. Only you can do that. That's what Joshua is saying here. It sounds like what I say to my wife every time. She's always moving furniture around the house. Say, Make up your mind what you're going to do here. <laughs> Hope she's not listening right now, Doris. Anyway. Make up your mind what you're going to do. Choose this day, right now. You, you're straddling the fence about it. If you're straddling the fence about this whole thing about Jesus and believing in Jesus for salvation and coming to Jesus, maybe you have some questions. That's good. You should. Or intellectual struggles. That's okay. Or reservations. You may have those, but listen, ultimately you have to make up your mind and choose whom you will serve. Make a decision. Because no decision is a decision not to trust in Christ. What else is this commitment according to Joshua? And Joshua hasn't even a model of what commitment is all about. He wasn't perfect. But he was a great leader and he obeyed God in everything the Bible says that God commanded him to do. And he was a committed leader. Thirdly, and think about you now, Middle River, as we soon will be celebrating your history. Commitment can have positive results on future generations. Commitment now can affect future generations. Joshua's commitment influenced other people. 
Now verse 15 is what we used to hang a little plaque in the house. I bet you some of you have it in your house or have had it in your house. Do what you want to do. But Joshua said, y'all do what you want to do. Make up your mind who you're going to choose. But as for me and my house, me and my family, we will serve the Lord. You see, Joshua was willing to state that and live that and model that and exert his influence on others in his generation. Our commitment to serve the Lord now, not, not tomorrow, not next Sunday, not next month, not next year, not when I think I'm going to die. Our commitment to serve God today can be used to draw others to him now. I remember when my wife and I were dating, we had family members and friends who weren't Christians. They didn't believe, and we thought, we just kind of came up with an idea. One night, I remember, we went out to Friendship Airport. That's BWI, in case you don't know. And we went out to Friendship Airport. They used to have a walkway out there. You could actually, imagine this. You could walk out on this thing and watch the planes take off and land. No security, none of that. We go out there and hug and smooch and stuff like that and then talk about God. Or maybe talk about God and then hug and smooch. I don't know. But while we were out there, we were dating. We said, you know what? Remember us having this conversation. Maybe if you and me get serious. We had lost our pastor. It upset me terribly. Now we didn't have a pastor. And we said, you know what, we don't have a pastor, so here's what we think, here's probably what we ought to do. Since we don't have a pastor, we shouldn't be thinking that it's dependent on having a pastor for us to grow, so we need to make a commitment to grow. That's what me, me and my girlfriend, they and my wife said. We said that together. And then we said this to ourselves. Maybe if we do that, some of our family members will come to know Jesus. You know that happened eventually by God's grace and not because of us. But I'm just saying commitment can have a powerful influence and God can use that commitment to draw others to himself. And i tell you something else it can do. The commitment we have today can make a difference in your future. Now, the Bible says... In verse 24, the people said to Joshua, they, they, they shout back, the Lord our God, we will serve, and his voice we will obey. When Joshua had said, y'all can't do this, it's interesting if you read the chapter, they say, we will do this. And he says, y'all can't do it. I think what he was saying, apart from depending on God's grace, you can't do this. But they said it again at the end of the chapter. The Lord our God, we will serve. We'll make a commitment. And his voice, we will obey. And that had some results in Joshua's generation. If you look down in verse 29, it says, After these things, Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died. He was 110 years old when he died. They buried him. And then in verse 31, it says, Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua and had known all the work that the Lord did for, jo for Israel. Joshua made a difference in his generation because of his commitment to be loyal, to serve only God. It made a difference. And it can make a difference now in Middle River Baptist Church. The sad thing is, Israel ended up breaking covenant with God. They did all right for a while, but if you go to the book of Judges chapter 2, beginning in verse 8 in Judges 2, the Bible says, Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at 110, the same thing over there, and they buried him. And then in verse 10 of Joshua chapter 2, it says, listen, and all that generation who were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them who did not know 
the Lord for the work that he had done for Israel. Now something, somewhere, there was a breakdown. After Joshua died and after his peers died, apparently the parents didn't teach the children the law of God, the Shema. They didn't teach them the Torah. They didn't teach them God's word. They didn't pass down the stories. Pass down the stories to your children. Pass them down to your grandchildren. Yesterday at my friend's funeral, we told oodles of stories. Oodles of stories. But his children told some of those stories, so they learned those stories from their grandfather or their father. So pass down the faith. Pass down Jesus. Pass down how you came to know the Lord. Tell your children. Tell your grandchildren. Let's don't let the next generation be like this generation who said there arose a generation that did not know the Lord. But commitment today can prevent that from happening in the future. And we can just say it's not going to happen by God's grace on our watch. We will be committed now. We will make a choice. We will make up our mind to be committed to follow Jesus. No turning back to the end, to the glory of God. And oh God, use that in future generations here at Middle River Baptist Church. You're never too old. You know, we used to talk about making rededications, recommitments. And I read the other day, some guy said some people rededicate themselves so much, the rededicators worn out. <laughs> that might be the case. But you know, sometimes we need to realize it's not a bad thing to rededicate ourselves. It's not a bad thing to recommit ourselves. I was reading a story about John Stott, the famous evangelical scholar, preacher. He wrote a book in 1971 called Basic Christianity. And when he did, after he wrote this book, he received a letter and here's what it said. Dear John, thank you for writing basic Christianity. It led me to make a new commitment of my life to Christ. I'm now old, nearly 78, but not too old to make a new beginning. I rejoice in the grand work you are doing. Yours sincerely, Leslie Weatherhead. Leslie Weatherhead was one of the most respected and influential Christian writers and leaders in the United Kingdom. He preached to thousands of people at City Temple. His books were read by thousands. He pioneered in the field of pastoral counseling, and he was president of the Methodist Conference there in the United Kingdom. And yet at 78 years of age, listen, he was not too proud, he was not too worn out to make a new commitment of his life to Jesus Christ. And may it also be true of us to say the same thing. Amen. Let's pray. Let me say to those who are listening by live stream or here today, have you committed your life to Christ? Have you said... You see, Jesus calls you to follow him. Have you committed your life to following Jesus? Is he your Lord? The Bible says if you confess with your mouth Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. But you have to make that decision. You have to make a commitment. Now, making a commitment does not earn you salvation. Jesus has already earned everything you need to be saved. He did all the work necessary to save you. That's why grace is so wonderful. He lived for you perfect life. He died on the cross for every one of your sins, past, present, and future. He took the, your hell on the cross, your judgment on the cross, your condemnation on the cross, and he will bury it under his blood and cleanse you and make you a new person. He rose from the grave the third day, which proved that he earned your salvation. But you must make the choice to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Have you done that? Nail it down. Make a commitment. 
and turn to Christ. And I'm going to lead us in a prayer to do that. And if it's your choice today to make a first-time commitment to Christ, you can take one of those cards in the pew and indicate that and hand it to me at the back or somebody here, Pastor Lonnie or Pastor Bruce, and we will help you to know how that you can follow Jesus. Your life will never be the same if you do. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your commitment to us by loving us and sending your Son, the Lord Jesus, to live and die for us, to be raised for us, for our sins, for our forgiveness, to give us eternal, abundant life. I pray for those who may be listening today who have yet to make that first time commitment to Christ, to take up their cross and follow Jesus, that today they will turn to you and say, Lord, I do believe in you. I believe you died for my sins. I believe you rose from the grave. And Lord, I want you to come in. I open up my life to you today. And I want you to come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Make me a new person. Help me to follow you. Lord, we thank you today. We thank you for your abundant grace. And may we all make this decision today to renew our commitment to you. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Pastor Keith, for that wonderful message on commitment. Uh, before we leave this morning, I just have a few announcements for you all. Um, Operation Christmas Child is, is happening again. Uh, we're doing it, and so uh, the boxes will be due on November the 15th. If you have any questions or need more information about it, please see Gail Owen uh, about Operation Christmas Child. It's a great way to give and touch lives of children uh, in the Christmas season. Um, also, uh, this is the Associational Missions Prayer Week, uh, so please uh, keep our association in, in prayer, the, the BVA. Uh, we talked about it earlier. Uh, Don did a wonderful job. Please pray for uh, Pastor Tally and, and Teresa and everyone who, who works with uh, the BVA. Um, I just want to remind you all that we do have a budget discussion this evening at 5.30, uh, so it'll be right here in the sanctuary, so uh, just remember uh, we have a budget discussion today at 5.30. Uh, and lastly, our refresh service is still going, so if you have not checked it out and you're interested in it, uh, please join us. Uh, we meet here every Sunday at 4 p.m. All right, let us pray. Father, Lord, we, we thank you, Lord. Uh, we thank you for your love and your grace, Father. We thank you uh, for your commitment to us, Lord, uh, that, that you loved us and you demonstrated your love uh, through your son, Jesus, and his death uh, on the cross for our sins, Lord. Uh, Lord, and, and for the fact that we can be reconciled to you, Father. Lord, and we thank you uh, just for your blessings, Lord. And we pray that we would uh, respond to your love with commitment, Father, that we will be committed uh, to your work, Father, committed to your way, Lord, committed to giving our lives, placing them in your hands. Uh, as Pastor said, it is our reasonable service, Lord, to give our lives to you for all that you've done for us, Father. So, Lord, as we leave from this place, Lord, we pray you would go with us, you would guide us, you would direct us, you would keep us, Father and strengthen us for all that you have in front of us. Lord, we ask these things, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We stand and let's sing Blessed Be the Tie as we exit. Blessed.